Here is a list of the top 10 facts about Legend of Korra Book 1 Air you didn't know. Okay, maybe you already knew a few of these, but only the diehardiest of diehard Avatar fans know about the number one moment featuring Toph. Let me explain. If you're new here, we do plenty of Avatar videos, including episode reviews, analysis, and theories, so please subscribe for more. This list consists of ideas, concepts, and facts gathered from commentary and interviews from the creators, Brian Knisco and Michael DiMartino, the cast and crew. Now on to the list. Number 10, how the creators really feel about the film that shall not be named. Brian and Mike's experience on the production of the film was disappointing to them to say the least. When asked in an interview by IGN if they would like to see a different version of the film, they responded with, I'd like to see it not exist. But some good came from the film. In commentary for book one, they tell the story of how they met Seychelles Gabriel, the voice of Asami. Seychelles played Princess Yue in the film. In order to just avoid mentioning the movie they loathe so much, they refer to the film as a wakeboarding competition. They met Seychelles on a plane to a table read for the wakeboarding competition. And Ed said to Reed, they were impressed by the actress's voice, having so much soul and spirit, so much so that they wanted her for Legend of Korra. Wakeboarding competition didn't work out. Yeah. We uh, yeah, I gotta... were like, hey, she was really good in that wakeboarding competition, though. We should uh, have her come read for this part. Yeah. Uh, it is now known as wakeboarding. Talk about finding the light in the dark. Well, that's a book two quote. At number nine, Korra's namesake. Bright created the character of the Nets avatar after Aang in November of 2009. They knew the Nets avatar would be a girl, but they couldn't agree on a new name for the heroine. Before starting production, they went on a landscaping photography trip. At their lodge, the owner mentioned his dog's name was Korra with a C. The name fell in line with other water tribe names with K's in them, and thus a legend was officially born. Also, fun fact about the namesake of Korra, the voice actress of Korra is also named Korra with a C. No, not the older Korra, voiced tremendously by Jen Varney, but the younger Korra, or as I like to call her, Potbelly Korra, is voiced by Korra Baker, the daughter of D. Bradley Baker, who is also the voice of Tarlock, Appa, Momo, the Nomad Chung, Secret Tunnel, and other animals. Number 8, Inspiration for Amon Lin Scene. The dramatic scene of Amon capturing Lin and taking away her bending in the rainy night was inspired by a scene from the anime Cowboy Bebop. The scene mirrors the death of Julia scene from Cowboy Bebop. Interesting enough, Steve Bloom, who voices Amon, also voiced Spike in the American dub version of the classic anime. Number 7, How Mako Learned Lightning Bending. While lightning bending was so rare in the world of Avatar The Last Airbender, shown only for high-ranking firebenders like Azula, Iroh and Fire Lord Ozai, many members in Lifetime of Korra seem very capable of doing it. This is because, as Brian said, it's kind of just a natural progression of things. People were asking like, hey, you know, in Aang's time, lightning bending was such a rare skill, but now it seems like so many people can do it. I mean, so the idea was that, yeah, once these things have sort of been pioneered, they become more and more common. Well, how did Mako learn this? Early on, we're introduced to Mako and Bolin. We learn of their shady past working with criminals in the Triple Threat Triad. The leader of the Triple Threat Triad is one Lightning Bolt Zolt, who gets his nickname due to his use of lightning bending, which Mako actually learned from. Number 6. Rami Malik is a very method actor. You may not know this, but Best Actor Oscar winner Rami Malik provides the voice of Tano, the leader of the pro bending team, the Whitefall Wolfbats. The characterization of Tano can be described as cocky, nasty, and to say the very least, creepy. Well, apparently when Rami Malik plays a creep, he goes full creep. The Bohemian Rhapsody actor was so convincing, he made some of the female voice actors, including Jenny Varney, feel very uncomfortable. So I remember when Rami came in, like he had this totally unique take on how to play Tano. A couple of the, the female actors were in the, the booth with him. And I remember after the session, they just came out and they were like, it totally gave me the creeps. I did. <laughs> I was in there and I was like, he's so good. He's so sleazy. Like, yeah. that was so sleazy. Nothing against him personally. No, he, just, he, he was so sweet. He's so nice. Jeez, no wonder why he won an Oscar. Number five, why Amon doesn't handle Korra himself. 
In the scene where Tarlok has Korra captured, Mon interrupts Tarlok's plans. Tarlok then tries to bloodbend him, but to no avail, ending with Amon taking away his brother's bending. Amon then has his henchman take care of Korra while he handles Tarlok. But why? He has Korra right there and Tarlok beat already. Is he just some incompetent villain like all the others? No, he is actually very calculating and somewhat caring for his brother. He is concerned that there is a chance Tarlok could reveal that Amon is actually his brother. He also just did this terrible thing to his brother, so a small part of him just wants to take care of him. Number 4. How Amon Takes People's Bending Away Ever wonder just how does Amon take away people's bending? You might say it's blood bending. Duh. I mean, the guy is a blood bending prodigy. Of course that has to do with that. Well, maybe just a little bit. But it actually has more to do with the healing subset of water bending. Frank Nisko says the way waterbenders heal is they open up the life force pathways so the chi can flow better and allowing the body to heal faster. Amon does the opposite. He blocks certain pathways. He has to be able to detect open pathways, which is why he couldn't take away Korra's airbending. It wasn't even open yet. Number three, Asami was supposed to be a villain. This is probably fairly known, but it's still really significant. Our favorite non-bender of new team avatar was originally supposed to be one of the villains. As Mike and Brian were writing the story, they originally had Asami working with her dad and Equalist, but the more they wrote, the more they really liked the character. They also assumed people would inherently think she was going to turn bad anyway, which honestly, some of us thought that was the case. So they did a good job subverting our expectations by subverting our expectations. Number two, why did Tarlok kill them both? The murder-suicide of Amon and Tarlok at the hands of Tarlok was truly a jaw-dropping moment in The Legend of Korra. I was left in awe wondering how did Nickelodeon let the show get away with this. The creators were also surprised as well, saying, incredibly, we got away with it, and that's all I will say about that. But was this just shock value? Tarlok seems like the type of guy who really cares about his own life so why kill himself and his brother? Well, this is actually a moment of true atonement for the would-be ruler of Republic City. When he says to Korra and Amon's hideout that he is truly sorry for the pain he caused them, he really means it. In the commentary, creator Brian Knisko says of Tarlock, This guy was just a total jerk the whole season, but even he had a conscience. And he realizes that the best thing for the world, society, is that they are not part of it. Man, who would have thought that Tarlock was the secret MVP of the show? I mean, just think about what Amon could have done if he survived. No one was stopping him, unless you were the Avatar, and that was really by luck. Number 1. The Secrets of Aang's Memorial Statue There is much more to the statue than meets the eye. Inside is actually a museum archiving Team Avatar's quest to end the 100-year war and save the world. But the secrets don't end there. Ever wonder who all built the statue? And how it was even made? Well, the answer is three words. Toph Mother Effing Bayfong. Toph actually made this statue. Um, wow. That it's made of metal. And, you know, we saw moments in the old series that she was really good at sculpting. Uh -huh. She sculpted that little miniature Ba Sing Se out of sand. Using her metal bending and artistic skills shown previously in Avatar The Last Airbender, she crafted the large scale statue of her best friend Aang. This just asks the legend of Toph, the greatest earthbender in the world, and you're a dunderhead if you forget it. So, did you know any of these? What do you think was the most surprising fact? Was there any unknown facts I left out? Please comment below. For more Avatar videos, please like, comment, and subscribe. And sincerely, thank you for watching. I'm out. Sorry, I have to say it. I'm on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> had to be done.